Well, uh, let me uh, start by saying that the, the NYCHA is truly one of the most important agencies the city government has. Born of the idealisms of the 1930s and the needs of the 1930s, enormously enlarged after World War II, now dealing with uh, difficult infrastructure issues, legacy issues, human issues, it is truly a monumental job. Shola Olataye, chair and CEO, born in Waterbury, Connecticut, raised in that city, public schools, Wesleyan University, Wagner School, uh, masters of public, uh, uh, a master's of, from the Wagner School, uh, worked in New York in so many public areas, starting at, starting, uh, at New York Cares early on in her career, then moving on to Campaign for Fiscal Equity, the, the wonderful organization that has fought for school equity, moving on into Housing, Vice President of, of HSBC Bank, a Vice President of Enterprise Community Partners who have built housing here in the city and around the country. She comes with an enormous expertise in supervising and bringing housing, uh, affordable housing, to be built. Um, she has a personal sense of the importance of public housing. Um, I took the moment to look at her uh, speech when she was appointed, and she talked about her grandmother who lived in Albany houses in, in the Bronx, and how important that apartment and that housing was to her grandmother and to her entire family. She's part of a team here in, uh, under the de Blasio administration. We've been fortunate to have Carl Weisbrod here and Vicki Bean, major, major players in the uh, probably one of the most important, maybe the most important initiative of the de Blasio administration, the affordable house housing issue. Uh, she's the third major player that, that addressed this, uh, this breakfast series. I am delighted that she's here today. I welcome to the microphone Shola Ola Toya Toye. Good morning. It is so wonderful to be here at New York Law School. I want to thank the dean for the invitation and for perhaps one of my best hires um, to date. And he's absolutely right when I called him and said, I need a smart, thoughtful lawyer who doesn't tell me no, but how about this? David Farber was the first name that came to mind. So thank you so much for that and for your leadership here at New York Law School for creating, I think, a really wonderful forum for city officials and others to talk about important issues um, that we, we face today. Also want to thank um, Ross and uh, uh, Alice Sandler, um, who uh, produced three amazing women, one of whom is a very dear friend of mine, Josie Sandler, who couldn't be here today, but she, in true Josie form, stacked the table with all of our former uh, New York Cares employees who are here, and my, my, my friends of over 20 years. Oh my goodness, Chantal, wonderful to see you. Um, and so thank you for that and for that introduction and for all of your leadership and, and, and in service to the city. Um, as I, I also want to thank Con Edison and Greenberg Trawrig Tra for supporting um, today's event, um, as well as uh, other members of my team. You heard the dean um, acknowledge all of our colleagues, including our first deputy general counsel, Kelly McNeil, um, our communications director, uh, Jean Weinberg, and many other NYCHA uh, folks who are here with us today. So as Ross mentioned, I've been the chair uh, and CEO of the New York City Housing Authority since March 2014. NYCHA is the city's largest landlord and as well as the country's largest public housing authority. One in 12 New Yorkers count on us for some form of home or shelter. NYCHA is, more, is home to more than 400,000 residents, 2,600 buildings, 250,000 commercial square feet and another million and a half non-residential non commercial square feet. If we were a city, we'd be the second largest city in New York State and larger than the city of Minneapolis. So as you might imagine, our law department is quite busy. And we are um, really uh, integral, I think, as Ross said, to the health of this city, to the future of this city, and something that the mayor from day one has talked about as an essential component to a vibrant, diverse, and inclusive New York City is the health 
of the country's largest and oldest public housing authority. Um, it's important to note that we have a, uh, a legal staff of about 80 attorneys that are supported by 80 support staff who function really as a full service corporate law firm for both the authority and our residents. The story of public housing in New York City, though, is in particular not so dissimilar to, public, to the story of public infrastructure around this country. The sad shame is that the continued federal disinvestment has meant a steady and insidious decline of this precious asset. We've lost more than $1 billion in federal funding since 2001 and more than 30% of that federally eligible, cap, uh, federally eligible capital funds as well. The result? Slow repairs, persistent repair challenges, the headlines, trash, really deplorable conditions in some of our communities. But New York City and the de Blasio administration is seeking to turn the page and write a new story for public housing and its residents. While we forcefully and loudly believe that all levels of government, of government must support the preservation of its public and affordable rental housing in this country, we can no longer ignore our financial reality. Last May, as, as Ross uh, indicated, the mayor and I released Next Generation NYCHA, our 10-year strategic plan that really is designed to set us on a sustainable financial path and to make a down payment on our $17 billion capital need or repair needs. Our plan is very simple, it's pragmatic, it's not the kitchen sink. It's really focused on us returning to the core business of being the country's largest housing provider, creating and managing to a new financial model, leveraging our real estate, and fundamentally changing the way we engage with our residents our most important stakeholders. For the purposes of today's discussion, I wanted to talk about that first pillar, becoming a better housing provider or landlord. So on average, every year, our attorneys manage over 30,000 rent collection and lease violation cases in housing court and through administrative hearings. They also handle corporate affairs, contracts, torts, real estate development, labor and employment issues, commercial law, policy and legislation, and housing litigation. We are challenged by several distinct realities to the Housing Authority. One is that the lease is the main tool that the authority has to use to enforce or encourage certain actions. NYCHA oper also operates under a 40-year-old consent decree known as Escalera, which enshrines significant due process requirements that govern every aspect of and in, in around administrative actions with our tenants. So by design, the landlord-tenant relationship is litigated administratively and in housing court, where in what is already one of the most tenant-friendly court systems in this country, NYCHA is perceived as the housing of last resort, thereby limiting our ability to use all of our legal remedies against and with to support the types of uh, actions that, we, that, in, that are helpful to the authority. Even still, NYCHA deploys a range of tools to make the relationship with our tenants less litigious. By example, working with tenants who owe back rent early and often and helping them to avoid eviction. For example, from 2014 to 2015, the numbers of residents who are evicted for non-payment has been decreased by 50%. And it is because of these types of initiatives that we have allowed people to, and, and, and supported people to remain housing, remain housed. I'd like to say NYCHA is in the business of housing people, not evicting people. So it's really important that these tools work and that we keep people in their homes. But the seemingly overwhelming workload certainly does constrain our ability as we now are really working to not only ask more of our tenants, but, but because of that, needing to change the way we do our business. So we focused all of our solutions on how to improve customer service, which in, which in turn should and hopefully will reduce some of these challenges. For example, NYCHA has spent time and money on the development of digital tools that make it easier and faster for residents to pay rent and, and 
to pay rent and to do this in a uh, easy, easy way. Currently, we collect about 70% of the rent that is due to us, or about $800 million. Rental revenues are the one part of our financial reality that we have some agency over. So our ability to actually increase that has a direct result in our ability to improve our operations. Cutting down on rent violations by improving services, such a very logical connection, reduces not only legal costs for the families, but also for the authority. In many of the conversations that I've had with residents across the city, one of the first things that um, the mayor said to me when, he, when I accepted this assignment was, Shola, you have to reset the relationships with your residents and, and then also come up with a plan to fix the housing authority. Okay, not so hard. Um, but as we, as we embarked, as I sort of accepted that challenge, it was really important that we listen, that I listen, and, and to our residents. So starting with day one um, at Middletown Plaza in the Bronx, sort of began a tradition, and, and of not a tradition, but really of how we are working in listening, have, putting the residents first in all of our work. So I've now visited more than 130 of our 328 developments. I think I have another half year to go if I continue on this pace. But it's been really, a really interesting set of conversations. And what was clear, whether it was from residents or my employees, 11,210, a third of whom live in NYCHA, one of the things that was consistent was a desire for a safe, clean, and connected community, regardless of where they live. This was something that we all can, can um, it, all, it resonates with all of us. And one of the things that has been it is a, a, a really sad fact in reality is that NYCHA residents are four times more likely, five times more likely, excuse me, to be the victims of violent crime here in this city as opposed to the, the rest of New Yorkers. And so in these conversations and the reality of the statistically small but yet persistent violent criminal element that is in, that is in our developments um, who prey on our residents, um, we really have to take and had to take a more proactive stance in, in, in eliminating that threat. And so we began, we, our, we really deepened the relationship with uh, our colleagues at NYPD, but really initiated a completely new set of digital information sharing tools and processes around really trying to ensure the tenancy of the residents who should be in, in the housing authority and really working to remove those who should not be. So as we work to fundamentally change the way we do our business through the delivery of services, for example, the length of time for basic maintenance repairs has decreased from 12 days uh, in June of 2015 to now about 7.2 days citywide. Um, we also are talking about a cultural shift. Um, issues that have proven more intractable include our credibility in housing courts due to the disinvestment, historic disinvestment, and poor service. This is a reality, and, and there is precedent for not only these, these perceptions. So we're working hard to change uh, the, this, these perceptions by transforming our operational model, really pushing down accountability at our developments, and changing the de delivery model of services at the developments. But 40 years of disinvestment doesn't change overnight, but focused, rational, and data-driven management solutions um, are what will produce the, res the results that our residents deserve. And so we continue on our effort. Um, it is a clear, uh, focus, pla focused plan that is very different from what is happening uh, in public housing authorities across the country for the students in the room who have studied this. Um, New York is unique in that we are not talking about tearing down our buildings. We are talking about preserving them, not only for the residents of today, but for the next generation. But let's be clear, that is a very different approach. It is not in line with the federal funding sources, and so it requires a, 
a bold and pragmatic approach to new sources, not only for the preservation, but the continued operation of these buildings. So that is what Next Generation NYCHA will accomplish. We believe that through our plan and the series of very specific strategies that we will begin to eliminate the recurring deficits that the authority has operated under for the past decade and really begin to essentially break even and get to a point of financial sus sustainability. And at, it is at that point that we can then really begin the large scale transformation and rehabilitation of our portfolio. This administration from day one has recognized how important housing authority, the housing authority is couple of major shifts, not only in policy, but also resulting in resources, was the forgiveness of our, our uh, police payments. Many of you are familiar with that NYCHA paid almost $70 million every year for policing services, as if we were not part of the city. And it was one of the things that the mayor reversed and forgave right, right within 90 days of, of being in office. The other thing is that the, the housing authority paid property taxes. Since 1949, we've been paying property taxes to the city of New York and at a tune of about $40 million every year. And so this administration also uh, forgave that. So those, putting those dollars back into our, our budget has allowed us to really um, begin to reinvest in those core services to address um, some of our persistent needs. So this is, the, we call this the rainbow graph because it's such an interesting um, uh, uh, illustration of the, the financial challenges in front of us. Um, the the multicolored uh, multi lines really su sort of suggest how we begin to attack the annual operating deficits and why that's so important so that we can address the larger capital needs, really trying to put the, the organization and its um, organizational finances on, on a stronger path. Um, so as part of that, those resources will also help us address that $17 billion need by actually investing and, and rehabilitating some of our most challenged parts of our portfolio um, and, and thus be really, re really reducing that need as well. And, and as, as we do that, we then uh, will work with the city to, as I said, um, really begin a large, um, major capital modernization, modernization effort on the rest of the portfolio. So this is, we, we named it Next Generation NYCHA for a reason, because this is a generation's worth of work. Um, we are working not only with legacy challenges, um, but real cultural shifts within the organization in terms of improving uh, and changing the operating model. And that is that has to happen um, so that we can deliver not on our mission and ensure that the housing authority is around for another generation. So uh, I want to thank the New York Law School again for the opportunity to talk a bit about what we're doing. And I would be pleased to take your questions. Thank you. As, uh, as we uh, do, we have microphones on both sides. Uh, people may go to the microphone, and we'd ask that you state your name. Also, um, I anticipate there'll be more than a few questions or comments. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you'd be relatively short so that everybody can speak. I do, before we begin, I want to thank uh, 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 Con Edison, which is our consistent sponsor, and Francis Wyshewski, Senior Vice President, is here. Uh, the law firm of Greenberg Traurig has also been a consistent sponsor, Verizon and then also the Gold Star attendees who uh, voluntarily contributed to this breakfast and they have a Gold Star on their, on their nameplate. Um, I want to say also that our next breakfast will be with Robert Capers, the new uh, U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District in April, and uh, we invite you for that as well. So now let's start with questions on, on my right over here. Uh, state your name, please. Good morning. Michelle Winfield from Samuel J. Tilden Democratic Club. Housing Committee Good morning, Chair, Ms. Winfield. and thank you so much. Good morning. I'd like to know from you if uh, you have, you stated you have 80 uh, legal and counsel at the uh, NYCHA. Do you also offer for NYCHA residents in law school internships with your legal team? 
So it, it actually, in, in our first Deputy General Counsel, Kelly McNeil, this has been, who's right, wave, wave your hand, um, this has been something that she has been personally committed to in really developing the next generation of young lawyers who are committed to um, public housing. So there actually is an internship program. Um, I believe it's a two-year uh, commitment. Um, and, and, and we get the best of both worlds, young, bright minds, as well as a lot of good work. So thank you thank for you that Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's go to this side. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, Name Thomas Lopez Pierre. For disclosure purposes, I'm a candidate for city council. In the council district that I seek to run, there are a number of developments, one of them being Douglas Houses, which Carmen Quinones, the tenant associate president, is here with us today. My, my question for you is, in your comments, you talked about leveraging um, uh, NYCHA's real estate. Um, in layman's terms, does, doesn't that mean um, basically selling off NYCHA's land for private development? And um, there are some that would say that's uh, a retreat from the mission at NYCHA. Could you speak on that, please, in more sure, detail? Thank definitely. you. Definitely. Uh, much oh, and your, my daughters love you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's great. So in, all, in, in full disclosure, we're also neighbors. So I see him around at the, neighbor, the coffee shop in Harlem and in and, and all manner of ca more casual settings. Um, so, so one of the major um, departures that this administration has made is, A, as I've mentioned, really reinvesting in the authority by, uh, by forgiving some of these longstanding uh, payments that, that we've made to the city. But there's also an acknowledgement that with the con continued decline of federal funding, we have to find other unencumbered sources of revenue to sustain our operations. And while we are thrilled that the state is back in the funding, the funding game for public housing and we welcome the continued support there, we have to continue to look for other resources. There are not a lot of options. And so one of the things that this mayor has committed to, and we, there's been lots to talk about around affordable housing, is the continued development of new affordable housing, the next generation of affordable housing. And so um, we are part of the mayor's affordable housing plan, of, his, of the 200,000 plan. Um, 10,000 of those units will be built all throughout the city on NYCHA development. This is 100% um, affordable housing that will have preferences for um, NYCHA residents. And this is something that, frankly, we have done. We did it under previous administrations. There are lots of existing, I think, positive models out there um, to address the, the significant affordable housing crisis. The second part of what we are doing is how do we continue to add to the affordable housing portfolio, but how do we raise some money? And so in a limited, a limited number of our sites, look, there are only so many valuable real estate um, markets. How do we continue to add to the affordable housing um, uh, portfolio, but also raise some revenue through the development of market rate housing? I think just to correct something that you said, a very distinct policy shift is that we will be leasing our land, not selling. So the land remains in the ownership of the public sector for, enti for its entirety. The other distinction is the continuate the commitment to the affordability levels that we will maintain in our uh, affordable or next generation nitrous next generation NYCHA neighborhoods program, of which we've committed the affordable program is at 60% AMI or lower. Um, the other distinction, again, is that any revenues, um, a significant portion of revenues that are generated from the development that we will do goes back to the development where the actual construction will occur. So this is both a pragmatic approach in acknowledging our financial reality while also con contributing to the affordable housing um, supply and, and making sure that the residents of the developments where these, where these activities occur are engaged in the process, but also see the benefit of any um, potential revenues to the authority. Have you announced any particular sites? Yes. So as part of uh, the first 100% uh, affordable program, we began a pretty public engagement process with the residents and the neighborhoods uh, in uh, downtown Brooklyn at the Ingersoll development, in the South Bronx at the Mill, the Millbrook development, and in Brownsville at the Van Dyke community. Um, we'll be making uh, developer selections imminently uh, within those sites. 
the next, and that's on the 100% afford, affordable lane in our uh, NGN neighborhoods lane or the 50-50 program as it's colloquially referred to. Um, we have begun engagement at the Wyckoff, <clears throat> the Wyckoff develop, development in uh, the Burham Hill community of downtown Brooklyn and at, the, at Holmes Towers on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. My name is Madeline Innocent, and I'm a member of Community Board 7, as well as we just created a newly uh, task force, uh, Community Board 7 slash NYCHA task force. And the reason why we uh, wanted to create that task force, because not only do we have NYCHA uh, development in our district, we also have people, uh, non-NYCHA residents, that we all need to connect with because we are getting, NYCHA is getting so much bad press, uh, or the residents itself are getting so much bad press that we wanted to work with the community and have a better dialogue. So going forward, how do you engage the, the, the not only NYCHA residents, but the community at large so we all can work together? Because I feel we're all in this together about affordable housing and preserving and, and doing the things that NYCHA needs to have done so we can all be better neighbors. So what will you plan to do to engage the community sure, as well? Sure. Thank you, Ms. Innocent. It's a very longtime resident leader. Um, one of the four pillars, as you'll recall, of Next Gen is engaging with our residents um, really and, and really the broader community in, in, a, in a different way and there's some very specific um, plans uh, and initiatives around that but I think the first commitment is one of showing up and being there and um, we have uh, as you know a very uh, a dedicated group of NYCHA staff, our resident engagement team um, that we have really helped, are helping to retrain, uh, really focusing them on um, really a more community and development based approach as opposed to kind of a more catch-all approach so that you actually have staff who are at the developments and understand the respective issues of that development. We know that you know Queen, whatever's happening in Queens may be different for folks that are happening in the Bronx. So A, one, one is having a very focused group of people who this is all they do, how they talk to residents um, in the many different languages that we also need to, to, to speak to our residents. Um, but also, not ha changing the way that we do that, right? I have been to many meetings where we stand in front of a room and get yelled at for 45 minutes and then everyone goes home. And everyone, all the NYCHA residents know that that's just kind of like a NYCHA meeting. And, and, <laughs> and the challenges are like, is that truly productive? Are we actually coming up with, are we identifying the issues? Are we actually coming up with strategies? And, 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 I, and in all seriousness, I understand that anger, but how do we have a more productive conversation? And so we've engaged community organizations in that, some who have organized against me and other, uh, uh, organized the, against the authority. We've engaged them to actually go and door knock uh, in our buildings. Um, we have uh, helped, brought them in to help retrain our staff. We have worked very closely with a number of community-based organizations and advocacy, group, advocacy groups, um, particularly around the conversations around state funding. So I think, it's, I think engagement's gonna look different depending on the community, but I think the commitment to do it and, and to do it in ways that ultimately result in um, what residents wanna see uh, and, and, and their imprint I think is really important. So and the community boards are certainly part of that discussion. Hello, uh, my name is Carmen Quinones. I'm the president of Douglas Houses. Um, Sheila, first of all, I want to congratulate you on um, uh, getting a lot of almost all of the presidents involved. Uh, we are definitely having those meetings where we are uh, talking with NYCHA about the plan and what needs to be fixed and what not, what we don't want to see. Um, what I want to talk about right now is, as you know, um, in the media, we have had nothing but bad news. Mold, mildew, people getting sick. We have, um, sh we're short of staff. Um, I just wanna know, how is it gonna get a little better mm -hmm. uh, when we have our own people in maintenance 
in our, in our agencies that are not getting the help that they need to carry out their jobs. Most of our caretakers are overworked and underappreciated. I just need to know how can we, as, um, as a community, come together and not only help the residents, but help NYCHA do its job to keep the place clean and people from uh, losing their jobs. Right. Thank you for your, your question, Ms. Kenyon. It's another very long time active. As you can tell, they show up when I, when I show up, when I'm here. Um, so, <laughs> no, no, all good, all good. So, look, I think um, kind of embedded in your question are a couple of different things. One, we have, we have a, about 8,500 folks who are at the developments, right, whether they be property managers down to caretakers, the men and women who, you know, literally, literally and physically move tons of trash every single day, who clean, clean buildings, and they work incredibly hard in a model that really has not changed since our inception, 81 years ago. And so one of the things that we've done this year, in the last two years, is, is really move to, move to, a more, to an asset management, uh, asset-based management approach. This is what HUD has really required um, a lot of, author of housing authorities across the country, which is the developments should be managed by a property manager who can actually manage their development, go figure. They actually understand their budgets, they manage to a budget, they actually deploy staff based on that budget. That really, NYCHA had really centralized a lot of that function, so we launched the Op, Op Mom initiative in 2014 at 18 developments, you know, pilots for us are still 22,000 units, um, where we retrained all of those managers and their supportive staff in current best practices around property management. We're working with organizations like IRM and others around how we retrain folks who a lot of times came up through the organization and may or may not, I mean, they are fantastic doers, but really managing to a budget is a new, is a, is a new, a new skill set. So really supporting those folks for success has been what we've been focused on over the next year, and I'm pleased to say that we'll be adding to that initiative um, by the end of this year with more developments, because that will be the way that we manage all 328 of our developments. The other thing I think it's also important to note that something that this mayor made a huge commitment to was really settling and making sure that all of our municipal workforce had um, had all of their contracts um, ratified. And that is something that I'm pleased to say we were able to do last summer. So all of our um, Teamster, DC 37, all of those folks have gotten their contracts and so no one's losing their job, right? But the, but the other thing is how do we help people do their job smarter? and really working with the unions to help retrain uh, folks who, um, and, and policies and procedures that haven't been updated in a very long time. And so that's been a, a major focus of our, um, our HR and training program. That has been something that I have specifically put resources in uh, to, to, to support and will continue to do. Um, the other thing that you mentioned is around, around sort of the, the, the level of cleanliness and, and for folks, the poor men and women who work at the King Towers, which is where in my neighborhood that I, I harass them all the time because I see it personally and understand what it means when you walk past the development and there's trash and there's just, just a, a all manner of what seems like disorder. And it doesn't mean that our men and women aren't working hard, but it's about when they're there. It's about when our people are there. Two thirds of our residents work and so when you leave your house at 8 a.m. in the morning and trash is piled up to six feet high and you come home at six o'clock and it's still there, the first thing you say is, didn't these people do work all day? Well, actually they have, but they, they leave at four o'clock because that's their schedule and that hasn't changed in, in 60 years. So we're really working with our union colleagues to change that and to really introduce a different level of service um, and, and really adopting more modern property management practices. So more to come on that in the coming days. Thank you. Hi, I'm Aaron Humphrey, uh, a housing resident, I'm TA leader for 344 East 28th Street, Strauss, also on community board and part of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt Democratic Club. I'd like to commend you on your bringing NYCHA to the digital age. But the thing I want to ask is that I noticed with NYCHA, sometimes there's two sets of information. One set of information they give to the outside community, and another set of information they give to the NYCHA community. 
Uh, for instance, this meeting, resident engagement did not know about when I called to try to RSVP, they said, we don't know what you're talking about. But yet on uh, political clubs and my other colleagues from the outside communities, they knew about this and they were able to link me in. How can we use these digital tools to make information more streamlined for both communities? Mm -hmm. Piggybacking on what the lady from Community Board 7 said, we sometimes do find that uh, information is just disseminated and also transmitted in two different ways from an insular NYCHA community to the mainstream community. And as gentrification is bringing us closer together with the park in the dark and land being more valuable and building taking place now in NYCHA grounds, how do we become more at one with the outside community? Great, great question. Thank you, um, thank you so much for, for all of the various community roles that you play um, and that you, that you lead. A um, couple things is that I forcefully reject the idea that there are two communities. I mean, I think that's what this mayor talked about. He talked about a one New York, and the work that we are doing is really to really connect, reconnect NYCHA into the city. So I really, I believe we have a, a duty to ensure that you know there isn't the NYCHA community and everybody else. We're one in 12 of the city. So it's a major, we, we are really one New York, and there are very, I think, specific things that we can do to, to, to improve the connections. Um, another major uh, thing that we have been, I have been personally committed to is the issue around transparency, really kind of lifting the veil over the housing authority. Um, and you know, we created something within 90 days that talked about NYCHA metrics, right? Everything that you want to know about NYCHA from our finances to our operational numbers, good and bad, is now online. I said to you earlier, did you know that there's something called the NYCHA app where you can actually now in Android and, and, and Apple phones actually schedule your own work orders, pay your rent, find out what's happening at your development. So we've, we've really worked to, I think, put a lot of information not only out there but also create forums for there to be a more dynamic conversation with residents. But I think your, your other point is like, you know, how come we didn't know about this event? You know, one of the amazing things about this administration is lots of people want to talk about public housing. And lots of institutions want to uh, invite me, our team, to events to talk about that. And believe it or not, I am not in control of the New York Law School's <laughs> invitation. I know you might think I am. Um, so, but what I can do, and something that we did start to do, is you know my schedule, my public schedule is public. So letting people know that, you know, the chair is going to be at New York Law School, and if that's something that pe people want to do, I think that's certain, something that's, that's very important. Um, but certainly, all of the events that are NYCHA sponsored, um, we do, I think, you know, we really work hard to make sure residents know about it, and I'm sure we can do much better um, in the future. So Even you having your inter-office uh, government, like contact CB6 and Sorry? community boards? Even having your inter-government uh, department contact community boards and let them know? Great, great suggestion, great suggestion. Thanks. Joel Kupferman, New York Environmental Law and Justice Project. And part of the disclosure, we were involved with litigation over the infill um, land sell-off at NYCHA Housing. Under the previous administration? Yes. Thank you. So we just hope there's lessons There learned. is no litigation. Okay. Yes. In the 19, late 1990s, over 700 people died in Chicago from the heat wave. Yes. They were, they were public housing residents. We're very concerned. Um, that when you sell off that open land, that you start creating heat islands, um, which most environmentalists admit and architects admit, causes an increase in heat. We really want to make sure that you totally value the, va the environmental and public health value of that land. When you start putting up buildings, no matter what type of building it is, it starts increasing the heat for the existing residents. And unfortunately, most, many NYCHA residents are not mobile and, and us are you know, vulnerable to increased heating. So, okay. and also, in the past litigation, um, NYCHA claimed that it was separate from the city, that it doesn't, um, the public trust doctrine doesn't apply, so all those rules in terms of preserving an open space is not applicable. I was just wondering if NYCHA has a new position on um, their open space and, and the you. value thereof. Thank you. So I'm not going to comment on previous litigation that I wasn't party to, but like, I think it's it's really I think your point is a really good one, and I, I you right you rightfully point out that 
um, more than 40% um, of our residents are over the age of 62. Um, and, and even within that, the significant percentages percentage of those folks who are over the age of 82. So people have really physically aged in place. Um, NYCHA was the middle class housing uh, in the 40s and 50s, so it, it makes perfect sense that um, a significant part of our, of our population is, 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 is aging. Um, the, the point around the vulnerability of those residents and the need to ensure that they are um, connected to not only services, but also that we have a real understanding of, of impacts of whether it be new development, but really anything that's happening in the community is a very good one and one that we take very seriously. Um, any development, and I think it's very important that I correct your statement and say lease, not sell. Um, any new development that we lease land to, to, to happen, um, as you know, one requirement as part of the city development process and building process is our environmental impact studies, and you probably know this better than I do, um, working very closely with local community boards on understanding impacts on school, school seats um, and other public services. So that remains um, a very important part of the work we do. We're actually, we'll be sitting down, we've sat down um, with uh, our community board officials in, in, in uh, the Burham Hill community to talk about this very, this very fact. Um, heat maps is sort of an interesting point, but school seats, uh, water, um, all of the sort of environmental impacts and making sure that NYCHA residents, but really the broader community, that there are the necessary uh, uh, investments in whatever infrastructure is needed to accommodate new development. Look, New York City is a city where buildings come up and go, go up and down all the time, but I think your caution is a good one. Um, also important for us to note that we really, because of the lessons learned, I think, post Sandy, uh, you know, created an emergency services uh, department. Um, we partnered with the Red Cross. Um, we now know in all 328 of our developments, every single vulnerable person, we have that person's uh, contact information. We know who needs life-saving equipment versus who doesn't. So we've made, I think, a fair a sort of significant amount of strides to be able to identify and, and support those residents. I'm sure there's more we can do, but I appreciate the comment. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Claude L. Winfield, and for full disclosure, I am the Vice Chair of Community Board 6, which is Aaron's Community Board, and I am the husband of that wonderful lady that spoke I to you first. That. <laughs> um, <Smart guy>. yeah. <laughs> and, and the former chair of our housing committee for 12 years, so I've been working on housing issues for quite a while. Uh, my question is the same question that I asked Vicki when she was here from HPD, similar. Uh, at in Community Board 6, we built the micro units mm -hmm. that they put on display. Mm -hmm. um, more importantly, we set aside, Council Member Mendez and I worked on a set aside for that building for eight units for veterans mm -hmm. solely. Um, as you move forward with your infill projects in the NYCHA, where you're leasing the land and building those buildings. Mm -hmm. Do you have a stream where you're focusing on helping us remove the veterans from the shelters or the streets or wherever they are so that as you build these affordable units, and hopefully I hope you can bring it down below 40% AMI for the veterans, uh, as you move forward, are you developing a stream so that they can take some of those apartments and some of those units? So thank you for your question, Mr. Winfield. Um, I, I think. One of the important things that we should all celebrate is that New York officially has ended veteran homelessness, um, and they have done As that. As we perceive it, yes. Well, and they have done that <laughs> yeah. largely through the work of the Housing Authority and and through the VASH program. Um, for those of you who don't know, veterans have, when you look at sort of federal uh, housing allocations, the VASH program, which is essentially a Section 8 vouchers for, uh, uh, for veterans, has actually grown. Um, and New York has not only received, uh, the Housing Authority has not only received those, a, uh, an increasing number of those vouchers, has, we've utilized 100% of them, so actually 
getting those vouchers into the hands of, of veterans and what the other important thing that, um, that comes along with, the, with those VASH vouchers are our services, which is also quite important. So um, a really important question, how do we uh, think about veterans in new development, which would not be public housing, so just a real important distinction. Um, in all of our uh, development that we've done to date, um, there's been a 25% uh, preference for, NYCHA, for existing NYCHA residents who wish to uh, leave public housing and, and perhaps apply for the new developments. That would be at least a minimum in any new development um, and something that we remain committed to. But again, I think it's important that we say, you know, when we sat down with the residents of um, Millbrook in the South Bronx, we heard loudly and clearly that the residents wanted to see senior housing there. So, well, we only learned that when we sat down after many, many meetings. So I want to make sure that as we do this development, residents can speak to what they believe the, the issues and, and, and priorities for them. Because I think it will be different. But you should know that our VASH program is 100% utilized. We work to ensure that all of those vouchers are on the street in the hands of vouchers and, and remain committed to that. Is them. that on your website? That it is program? on our website. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, uh, I'm a graduate of the class of 67. My name is Raymond Schwartzberg. I'm a trial attorney. I usually represent injured claimants. Uh, in the case of, for example, the uh, New York City Corporation Council, if there's a case against the city, when a claim is uh, interposed, they have an employee known as an assistant corporation counsel, one of a large defense team, and they interpose their answer and defend the case throughout. And so do, uh, for example, most insurance companies have house counsel. In the case of the ho housing authority, in the uh, event of a tort claim or injury claim, invariably, in fact, I should say always in my many years of experience, they have outside counsel, usually an eminent defense firm, uh, a firm that has a uh, name well known in the defense industry. And they pay, they meaning the house authority, housing authority pays the per diem rate to a non-employee outside attorney. Now that has got to be very expensive. And I was just wondering why the housing authority, bearing in mind that it seems to be embarking upon significant cost-cutting uh, programs, why does that seemingly extremely expensive method of operation uh, continue? Is that also something that's been done for 80 years? So they're going to keep piling up these extraordinary, unnecessary, uh, non-economical expenses, because that's the way they've been doing it all, all these past Those years. Those are your words, not mine. So, uh, well, that's thank my you inquiry. for your question. It, okay, it, it, so, so um, uh, just in the, in the concept, in the, in the context of landlord-tenant claims, 30,000 cases a year. I mean, uh, I know, I, I'm, I'm yeah. getting to it. Um, and so I think it's important to note that um, we have uh, a, a largely represented number of employees, meaning that, that with, with, ex, with extensive costs associated with that. Um, there are also, uh, as part of whether it be torts, whether, whether it be other, other types of cases, um, we've made the, the decision to use outside counsel on some of those things um, and really focusing our in-house staff on, um, on, on matters that uh, around a direct landlord-tenant issues um, or, or other corporate affairs uh, issues. Um, we've, we have actually uh, we've reviewed a lot of our contracts that we've had with outside counsel um, to make sure that they are focused on the areas where we need them to be focused. But this is a practice that the city of New York uses, not only at the Housing Authority, but throughout. And um, the no, cost- the city doesn't the, do that. The, the, that's, the co that's debatable, but I think the cost, the cost benefit to us um, is one that we're able to tap some of the great um, legal expertise um, while also being able to focus our staff resources on, on the other sort of crushing number of, of, of cases that, that we see. It is. I find it that is. quite debatable, but thank you for your answer. Thank you for your comment. This will be the last question. Hi. My name is Vivian Laborde. I'm the Director of Government and Community Engagement at Lincoln Center. And under the, the leadership of our new president, Jed Bernstein, we've really been doing a lot more to 
um, reach out to the community. We've been bringing free arts programming and education to more public schools and to more libraries and community centers and homeless shelters throughout the five boroughs. And a big priority for us is engaging more NYCHA residents in our programming, particularly in, in a program through which we'd like to bring more NYCHA residents to our campus to experience live performances and really immerse them in arts-rich experiences. This is part of our efforts in making the great art that Lincoln Center has to off offer accessible to all, regardless of income or geographic location. And so I was wondering if you had any advice on how best to engage NYCHA residents in our programming, um, if there are any particular organizations. <laughs> I think you have some uh, volunteers. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you to Jed. I've met with Jed. He's a Wesleyan grad. We're very, we're the Wesleyan mafia. We're kind of everywhere. Um, I think that that's wonderful. We want more institutions like Lincoln Center to be um, connecting with our residents. That's why we created the Fund for Public Housing this year, um, our 501c3, that will re that's really looking to leverage philanthropy to support these types of partnerships. Um, look, I think the first thing you do is you talk to residents um, and you sort of find out what they're interested. And um, and we can and 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 we can support uh, in terms of uh, making sure that you have space, et cetera, to meet. But I think the first thing to, to do is to talk to them and to you know utilize um, all of the manner of tools that that organizations do to find out what programming, what demographics make sense, and um, any way that we can be helpful through data, et cetera, we'd be happy to do so. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, very good. Thank you very much for the. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the good questions and for the uh, wonderful answers and the wonderful talk and all that you're doing. <clears throat> As um, I, I would like to thank, pardon me, the people at New York Law School who helped put this together, Brian Kasuba, the Associate Director of the Center, Lillian Valley, Santiago, Jesse Denno, and Jessica Bronstein, who've been very helpful, and other students who are here who ushered and, uh, and helped people come. As we always do at these events, we'd like to give a product of the scholarship of the law school and uh, to show off for quite a wonderful morning, very exceptional, with wonderful information about, uh, uh, about, uh, the, about NYCHA. I present the book by my colleague Michael Rawford, The Law Book. It's a wonderful uh, history of, of the great litigations of uh, the era, none of which involved NYCHA, ah, unfortunately. I really like but, uh, <laughs> but it's. But the next edition, perhaps. <laughs> we, uh, our next um, speaker will be Robert Capers, who is the new U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District. In April, please come. We welcome you, everyone to come. Thank you so much. That was terrific.